So we're in the ninth chapter of Pesachim, and we're investigating various alternative kinds of Pesachs. I would say that's really the theme of this chapter. We're looking at alternative kinds of Pesachs, and particularly, you know, what happens if things go wrong. We closed yesterday at the end of the third Mishnah, which began Ma Bain Pesach Rishon Lasheni. Ma Bain, what's the difference between the first Pesach and the second Pesach? The first Pesach being in Nisan and the second Pesach being in Iyar. And we're going to carry on exploring these differences. And we're going to come back actually to this expression Ma Bain. What's the difference between? Let's see how this develops. And we're going to begin, by the way, by um, with a little bit of a step backwards. So we are in the ninth chapter. But in order to understand the ninth chapter, we need to jump back into the seventh chapter, into Mishnah 6 of the seventh chapter. And this Mishnah describes a situation where the whole of the community of Israel cannot celebrate Pesach. So yesterday we talked about the possibility that one person perhaps might not be able to celebrate Pesach. And the classic example is someone who is Tamei Nefesh, someone who's been in contact with a dead body. And we said, well, we asked, well, okay, why would you be in contact with a dead body? This is someone in your tent, right? And we said, well, the most likely explanation is if that's a member of your family, who's passed away, that's why you've been in contact with a dead body. And then you will celebrate Pesach a month later. And we, we, we can all, I think we can all understand the psychological wisdom of that part of the halacha. But what if the whole of the community cannot celebrate Pesach? That is the question which the Mishnah addresses in chapter 7. We skipped over that chapter because we, we rushed on to number 10 and now back to 9, but we need to go back to this. Nitma kahal or rubo, the whole community or the majority of it were unfit. Or shehayu hakonim to me vehakahal torim. Or maybe the priests were unfit, but the community was pure. So the priests can't, the priests can't, um, um, they, they can't slaughter the, the, the offerings. What do we do? We actually celebrate Pesach in impurity. It's quite an extraordinary halacha, this. I, and I, I don't think, I don't see how this applies to other festivals. But remember, we said yesterday that Pesach is a festival on which the whole of the Jewish community comes together. It's the... It's the creation of the nation. It's the integration of the nation. That's why we give people a second chance. If they don't, everyone needs to participate in the Pesach. If they can't participate in Nisan, they get a second chance in Iyar. The community is absolutely critical here. And so if the whole community can't celebrate Pesach, but Tahara in a, in a state of purity, it all celebrates it in a state of impurity. And then the Mishnah goes on to say, if a minority of the community were impure, uh, those who are clean keep the first Pesach, and those who are not clean, not pure, observe the second one. And of course, we mentioned yesterday that that's why perhaps the Mishnah of, of Pesach is called Pesachim, it's called Pesach in the plural, it's called two Pesachs, because there are two Pesachs, there's the first one, and there's the second one, and the track date deals with both. But we learn in chapter seven, there's a possibility that the whole of the community is impure, and we still carry on celebrating Pesach. And so going back to our ninth chapter, the Mishnah is going to ask, a Pesach she'bar v'tumah, what happens with the Pesach in which everybody which comes in impurity, i.e. the Pesach, in which the majority of the Kehila is impure. Okay, how does it work? And one of the things that this Mishnah teaches is that um, although people with, for example, um, in contact with a dead corpse will eat of the Pesach, the 
the Pesach may be sacrificed in impurity, but nevertheless, and, and this is a halacha, we don't fully understand um, people with an omission or menstruants or women after childbirth don't eat from it. So they don't eat, even though it's sacrificed in impurity, they don't eat from it. But the Mishnah goes on to say, if they do, they're exempt from karet, from cutting off. And people with these, people with an omission or menstruants or women after childbirth shouldn't enter the, the Midash. But somehow at Pesach, you know, we're going back to these things of community, I think, somehow after Pesach, as far as eating the Pesach sacrifice is concerned, there's an exception. If it's slaughtered in purity, then they don't eat it. But if they do, they're, they're exempt from karet. And Rabbi Eliezer exempts them even from entering the sanctuary. So it's a detail, if you like, of the Pesach, which comes in impurity. And the Mishnah then goes on to look at other kinds of Pesachs, other different kinds of Pesachs. So it asks, it goes back to Marbein. Marbein, what's the difference? Marbein Pesach meets Rhyme, the Pesach Dora. What's the difference between the Pesach in Egypt and the Pesach of subsequent generations? And the Mishnah explains Pesach meets Rhyme. Mikacho mi ba'asor. The Pesach in Egypt, and now we're talking about the lamb, right, or the goat. We're talking about the Pesach sacrifice. And usually, by the way, when the Mishnah talks about the Pesach, it's talking about the sacrifice. It's not talking about the holiday. Pesach meets Brian, Mika Chobe It's taken on the 10th. Veta'un hazavab agudat It requires sprinkling with a bunch of hyssop. Um... I heard a very interesting podcast from Ravalisha Ankalovitz, who explained that this hyssop is a it's a med special Mediterranean type of hyssop that has a peculiarly hairy structure on it on its leaves. So it 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 somehow it, it you can it takes a lot of water, it takes a lot of liquid when you dip into it. That's why they use this particular type of of, of hyssop because basically you get a lot of blue when you dip your hyssop into it, you get a lot of blood to sprinkle on the lintel. So it needs sprinkling on the um on, on the lintel and on the two on the two doors, on the two, two um uh, door uh, doorposts. And it's eaten in haste in one night. Now we know that to a certain extent we eat our Pesach in haste because after midnight it it, you know, it it goes off, right? You can't. It has to be eaten by. It has to be eaten by midnight, and it becomes um, uh, uh, basically. It makes the hands tame after the next day. But so there is a remnant of that in terms of our own eating of Pesach. But Pesach Dorot Neheg Kol Shiva. Pesach Dorot. We might eat the Pesach itself in one night. But the Pesach celebration itself runs for all seven days. That's the prohibition on chametz, and of course the additional sacrifices which were brought in the baby dash, and the recital of Halal. And the Bartanur actually expands on, I mean, this Mishnah seems incredibly compact, and the Bartanur expands on it a little bit. He says, um, I mean, the Mishnah says, you know, just one night, whereas the Pesach of subsequent generations is kept all seven days. And the Bartonur actually says, you know, our missioner is deficient. Matnitin hasuri machsura. It's deficient. And it should be read as follows. It's eaten in haste in one night and it's fermentation leavening during the whole day. That means that in the Pesach of Mitzrayim, the people are only forbidden to have chametz for one day. That's what the Mishnah should have said. But with regard to the Pesach for subsequent generations, it's firm and the ban, it's um, it, the, the ban on fermentation or leavening should be for seven days. The Bartner is very compact here. Maybe we need to expand out a bit in the translation. It's chametz is for the whole day. 
as far as the Pesach of the generations are concerned, its chametz lasts all seven days, which means, of course, the ban on chametz. And then the Baal Nur is going to quote a verse, because the Pesach in, about the Pesach in Egypt is written, V'lo yachel chametz, hayom atem yotzim b'chodesh aviv. You're going free on this day in the month of Aviv, and you don't eat chametz. So we declare that chametz is only eaten, it's only not eaten, as far as the Pesach Mitzrayim is concerned, on exactly the day when you leave Egypt.